Hi, Kidless. This is your first set of uh, YouTube lecture notes. Please excuse the kids bop in the background. Um, yeah. Um, so in this chapter, the things we are looking at are how astronomers name stars and compare their brightness, um, Earth's motions, causes of the seasons, and astronomical cycles. So like I had shown you guys in class, what I feel like is a good way to take notes in my class is to section them by, um, by section. So this section you could title Constellations and Stars. So, and then the second section will be uh, Celestial Sphere, and the third section would be Solar Motions. So we'll break up all of the notes um, within three. So there'll be three sections of notes. And the other thing to remember is the way that I would like you to do notes. And again, next semester, you can choose whatever works best for you. But I'm trying to show you methods that I feel like work is to draw a line down your page. And here, write maybe slide titles, examples, um, any extraneous material, um, maybe keywords. But this becomes your guidepost so that you know where to look in the body of your notes for the information that you need. So as we looked at in class, ancient cultures have always looked to the sky to explain their origins, to describe creation stories, um, to describe their greatest heroes. Um, and then we have this correlation between astronomy and policy and religion because the most ancient priests were also the astronomers. So we can see this in structures like Stonehenge that add astronomical origins. Um, even the pyramids of Giza, they are pretty sure align with the belt stars of Orion. Most of these things seem to have correlations with um, celestial phenomena and motions such as the solstices. So the sun dagger is something that, this is a hole in the rock, Inside this cave, there is this picture that um, no one is entirely sure what it is, but only on the summer solstice, the sunlight comes through and shines and makes a dagger that fills this space perfectly. Um, this is what it looks like. It's protected. This is in Navajo land, um, so no one can see this unless they have special permission. Um, but there are things like this that are all over the planet. And astronomy has been a necessary tool um, since the, the dawn of humanity. So even though humans haven't been on this planet for very long, humans have needed to be able to read the stars to know just basic functions. So when to migrate, how to store food, be able to predict events, know how to plant. I apologize, my app totally functifies my bullet points. So you may see my formatting is a little off. The, the app I use kind of skews it. Um, enabling survival, knowing the time of day, like we talked about places that have extreme temperatures. Um, so northernly indigenous tribes would need to know when to move, when to set up camp for the season. And this is something that animals are still able to do. So they can judge the time of year by the angle of the sun. So animals are still doing this. So the ancient priests were astronomers. Again, like I gave you the example of Chinese astronomers, they were kept alive by being able to predict seasonal events because if they were wrong, they were beheaded. So things like our nearest celestial neighbors, the sun, moon, and planets, were often seen as gods, goddesses, or heroes. And when we had um, changing phenomena, like, say, comets, impacts, or eclipses, these were thought to bring disaster. And this is cross-culturally, across um, civilizations, across oceans, and across time. So a lot of times these were seen as warnings, or they were seen as an omen. So a lot of times they, people would interpret it to mean that they had an upcoming victory, or maybe an upcoming defeat. And I gave you guys the example of the Aztecs at Chichen Itza that had massive, massive killings um, that were pretty darn brutal. And that aligned with, um, with celestial events because they thought that if they could do enough killing that it would keep the sun there because especially things like eclipses were really revered because that would mean in the middle of the day for a solar eclipse, the sun would be completely blocked out. So all of our calendric systems all have celestial origins. So we have our, our closest neighbors and the ones that are the most obvious to any of our ancient ancestors are the sun and the moon. So we have solar calendars, we have lunar calendars. So ancient peoples such as in Egypt also used the, the stellar rotations. So they looked to a star called Sirius. And we can see references to Sirius in a lot of the ancient um, Egyptian um, pyramids and tombs. Um, they had reverence for the star Sirius. 
So the Roman emperor could change things dramatically. Um, and in fact, as the example I gave you in class, um, around 300 AD, Caesar, one of the Caesars, um, he issued a decree that they were going to have a universal calendar because prior to that, every civilization followed their own plan. There were some that followed 13 months because there was a fuchsia, the, the 13th zodiacal sign, so they followed 13 months. Some of the months were different lengths. So within 300 years, you had peoples that were 100 years off of everyone else, and it was very hard to unify things like trading and political systems. So here in the image, we can see the path of the sun in the summer. And this is about accurate for our latitude and the path of the sun in the winter. So we can see just the seasonal difference in the angle of the sunlight. So astronomy also tells the time of the year. We can tell um, what time of year it is by what stars are up. We have winter constellations, summer constellations, and we have circumpolar constellations that never rise and set. We can tell what time of day it is by knowing how high the sun is. So the sun is the highest around solar noon, which is actually not entirely what your clock says. You'll see when we go to the Griffith Park Observatory, they have a whole hallway that illuminates at exactly solar noon. It's pretty awesome. Um, so we can tell the time of sunrise and sunset and also moonrise and moonset. Moonrise and moonset are determined by what phase of the moon it is. So we know we have 88 official constellations. So a constellation is different than an asterism. So a constellation would delineate a specific region of the sky. So whereas an asterism is just a popular name for a group of stars. So I may give you a question like this on your test and I may say, you know, if you have something like the Big Dipper, what is that an example of? And you would need to know that that is an asterism. That's a common name. But the constellation name for that is Ursa Major, which means the bear. And I have no idea how anyone looked at that and saw a bear, because I don't. So here we can see Orion, the hunter, who is hunting Scorpius. So in past, um, constellations were differentiated from the background stars by being the brightest stars in the sky. A lot of times these told stories that were then passed down. But today we refer to constellations as specific regions of sky. So you would know exactly where a star is if we said what constellation it were in. But constellations are just a consequence of something called the projection effect. They are not a function of distance because the stars in a given constellation can be located vastly different distances from each other. And if you were anywhere else in the solar system, you wouldn't see constellations as we see them. So for example, we can look at Orion and we can see just looking at Betelgeuse, the red shoulder, that it's actually way further out here. And we can see in looking at Rigel, which is the blue foot, it's way the heck out here. So here, the alpha means that that is the brightest star in that grouping. The beta means that it is the second brightest. And we can see this guy way the heck out here. So that would mean that these have to be extremely bright stars to appear. So here again, we can see, just looking at the constellation Orion, and we can see the glowing red Betelgeuse, glowing blue Rigel. And the way that we would differentiate our brightest stars from our fainter stars within a given constellation would be by the Greek letters. So we can see that within Orion, we would call that Orionis, and that would be given an A. And again, my app changed the, the formatting here. And then the next brightest would be a B. So here's some common constellations, and you can look just within this, and you can find some stars that are different colors. So we can see yellow, we can see red, we can see the glowing red eye of Aldebaran, the bull in Taurus. Um, we can see the bowl of the Big Dipper pointing to Polaris, which is the handle of the Little Dipper. And Polaris, as I mentioned, and as we will see in the next class, Polaris is not our North Star due to brightness. It's a positional star, and we'll see why that's our North Star in the next class when we talk about the celestial sphere in motion. So Alpha Centauri, that is um, our next closest star cluster. There's about four stars within the Alpha Centauri complex. And remember, that's about 4.2 light years away. So the ecliptic is the apparent path of the sun. And we can think about that as really just an extension of Earth's equator into the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere being this concept of a sphere of stars 
the sphere that stars are attached to that moves around us. And we know that, obviously, it's not moving around us. We're moving. Um, but we can think about the ecliptic as the path that everything follows. So this whole argument that there's going to be planetary alignments, well, really, all the planets are always aligned in this path of the ecliptic. So that's technically the path of the sun, because the sun, the planets, all the moons exist in a relatively equal orbital plane. And that's the ecliptic. So then the sun moves through the signs of the zodiac along the ecliptic. So here we can see the ecliptic and the zodiac again. So the 12 constellations that the sun moves through are called the zodiac. So here we can see each of your probably different astrological signs. And we should notice that they're not all equal distance from each other. And remember that there's one left out. As you saw in that video, there is a 13th, a fuchsia, that is no longer in here. So the sun moves along the ecliptic through the signs of the zodiac. So we can determine and delineate which stars are the brightest in our sky by using something called the magnitude scale. Now, when we talk about stars, we'll learn the differences in magnitude because there's a parent magnitude based on distance and absolute, which is an intrinsic property. But for us right now, for our purposes, we're just going to say that magnitude is the brightness. So we're basically giving the brightness a rating. So the way that we can quantify that, now if you are not a quantitative person, if you are just interested in the concepts, not the math that goes with it, totally ignore me right now. For those of you that are quantitative, um, notice that I do have a typo here. I apologize. This is fifth. So the difference between a first magnitude star and a fifth magnitude star is a hundred times brightness. So the difference in each magnitude is a factor of about 2.5 in apparent brightness. And this is an inverted scale. This is something that all of you guys need to know right here. The larger the number, the fainter the object. So the naked eye limit, as we said in class, was a magnitude six. Those would be very faint stars. Very bright stars would be about a magnitude negative one. Bigger number, fainter object, lower number, brighter object. That's the way you can remember that. So here again, for those of you that are quantitative, analytic, mathematically minded students, um, this table is looking at the difference in flux. So we can think about flux as being the total energy over a given area. So every star has their magnitude, and this is what that magnitude equates to. So in a difference of magnitude between 1 and 2, you have a difference in brightness of 2.5. But since um, between each is a factor of 2.5, that's how when you get to the difference between where you have a 5 magnitude difference, you're really looking at 100 times brighter. And to quantify those differences, so again, this would be just those of you that are looking at the math behind why this is, um, why it's not even intervals. If we were to just look at the brightness of Betelgeuse, which measure, measures a magnitude of 0 0.41, and then the brightness of Rigel, which is a brightness of, or a magnitude of 0.14. So we should be able to see that the brighter star here would be Rigel, because Rigel is the smaller number. And we can also think about this as being a blue star. That's a red star. Blue is hotter. But again, due to, to distance differences, um, we know that this guy um, is probably a little bit closer. So we can quantify that by taking the difference in their brightness, which gives us 0.27. So then we find if we take that difference, that magnitude difference of 0.25, to the power of 0.27, which is what that should say. So that should be the up caret to the power of 0.27, that we get 1.28. So in other words, Rigel is 1.28 times brighter than Betelgeuse. So for everyone, whether you're qualitative or a quantitative learner, I would expect you guys to know if I gave you a magnitude of something, I would expect you to know whether it's you know, brighter or dimmer than something else, or expect you to know if I gave you a list of magnitudes, which would be the brightest. Um, and I might expect you to know some specific things like what the naked eye limit on objects is. So just as a reminder, the naked eye limit, yes, I found a lightsaber pointer, is about six. So we can see that there are objects that are below zero. So just as a function of distance, 
The sun has a magnitude of ne negative 26. Full moon is about negative 13. Venus at its brightest is negative 4. So, and remember that these things are all much closer than our more distant stars. So Polaris, again, not a very bright star, but it is our North Star due to positionality, not due to brightness. And it's only about a magnitude of like 1.8 or something like that. It is not a big, bright, or close star. Um, and then Hubble Space Telescope can see to a magnitude of 30. And we looked up last class that the replacement for Hubble, which is nowhere close to identical for it, but Hubble is fading. It is 25 years old. We wouldn't replace it with a 25-year-old technology, such as you wouldn't replace your computer with a 25-year-old computer. Um, but it is being replaced with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be in a translunar orbit. It's actually going to orbit around the moon. And it'll have a magnitude of 80. So it'll be able to see... Um, much further, so two and a half times further than the Hubble will. Um, so again, our smaller numbers are our brighter objects, and our bigger numbers are our fainter objects. Now, just um, one thing that's kind of interesting to note, if we were to put the sun at about a standard distance where we would put other stars at to determine their absolute magnitude, which is a distance of, I want to say, 27 light years, then the sun would only have a magnitude of four. It would be barely visible. And as I told you in class, the sun is hardly visible and definitely not um, distinguishable from the background stars at Pluto, and solar panels wouldn't even work from the sun at Jupiter. All right, so um, again, these would be some distances that you may want to take a look at. So Sirius is our brightest star in the sky. It's about a negative 1.4. And again, brighter stars have lower numbers. Fainter stars have the bigger numbers. So please give me a good summary for the day. Um, you can just show this to me next class or even the following class. But we are going to be looking at on Thursday the celestial sphere. Have a wonderful weekend.